All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jennifer Stoddard. I'm the Director of Education and Conservation at Reed Park Sioux, which is in Tucson, Arizona. I am also the um, Education Advisor for the Tamandua SSP as well. And um, I wanna thank you for, for joining the talk tonight or this morning, wherever you happen to be joining from. Um, and also thank you to Mariella and Kelly, um, Kenny for reaching out to me and inviting me to speak tonight. Um, my talk tonight is gonna be about how Reed Park Zoo uses Tamandua as animal ambassadors. And also at the end, we'll talk about um, some opportunities for conservation education messaging. Um, I've worked at the Reed Park Zoo for 18 years, and we've had Tamandoa for almost the entire time that I've been here, and I've had kind of the pleasure of working with them in an education um, animal ambassador capacity all that time. Um, just a, a note, I am going to talk specifically about how we use Tamandoa as animal ambassadors and training them specifically for education programs, um, not necessarily in the animal care um, standpoint, but um, Dr. Walt Colburn, if you're interested in that and weren't able to listen to her um, talk that she did a couple of sessions ago, she went into a lot of the health issues um, and dietary issues. Um, so that would be a great one to listen to um, if you want more information on that. Um, and she is um, one of the vet advisors for the Tamandoa SSP. So I have one quick disclaimer to talk about. Um, and that is that I am specifically just going to focus on ideas and thoughts and ways that we do things here at Reed Park Zoo. And um, when we get into messaging, um, kind of the concept, I'm going to kind of bring up some of the different ways that people that I know of are talking about Tamandoas for education messaging. And then hopefully at the end, we can kind of have a discussion about thoughts and um, things that make you might kind of think about things and we can discuss together about best practices and messaging. So let's begin. Um, so here at Reed Park Sioux, um, we have had um, 16 Tamandua. Um, they have all served as animal ambassadors um, throughout their time here at the zoo. We currently have four Tamandua. And um, we have um, three females ranging in age from 17, 12, and then two. And um, our two-year-old is actually the great granddaughter of um, our 17-year-old. So it's kind of nice that um, our family tree kind of lives on. And I know some of you joining us, we have had Tamandua who have been born here that have been sent to your zoo um, as well. So it's kind of nice that um, we've had a lot of Tamandua breeding here at the zoo. And um, speaking of breeding, we are active in the Tamandoa SSP. We have had um, 10 pups born here at the zoo. We start training with them very, very early. Um, we do have to take them and make sure and weigh them and make sure that they're getting enough milk, that they're gaining weight and kind of doing quick health checks that way. And that's when training first starts, allowing us to kind of um, desensitize them to being around us. We always put them on some sort of stuffed animal as well to keep them more comfortable while we're moving them from their mother so that they, um, you know, they, they're more calm while they're going through and being with us and it doesn't um, stress them out. Um, after a couple of months, again, it's depending on the, um, the female anteater, I'm sorry, Tamandua, um, we do start training with them and you can see the picture in the middle. Sorry. That's the picture in the middle is actually um, the first pup that I worked with many, many years ago. Um, and that is our 17 year old that's currently here at the zoo. And we do start having them kind of passively observe training sessions while mom is harnessed and doing a targeting training um, in her presentation space. We have done um, presentations with mom um, having baby on her, her back, both of them being harnessed. Um, so we, we do start them um, training as early as possible. And we work really closely with our vet staff um, to determine when that is. And every Tamandoa is different. Every pup is different. And so it's a really close relationship with our animal care staff and our keeper staff for determining um, when we can begin targeting and then also when we begin harness training um, with the pups as well. The last photo on this slide is of Liana, who just recently came to us from the zoo, and she is the great granddaughter of the Tamando in the middle. Um, she just turned two a couple of um, weeks ago, 
And she's already doing presentations, target trained and harness trained um, as well. And she is here um, for a breeding recommendation um, with the male that we recently got as well. So some of the behaviors that our Tamandua are trained to do, um, they are all trained um, to kennel. That is the first um, behavior that we train them. It also helps the animal care staff as well. Um, and this behavior with all of them is extremely solid, um, so much so that we will always have the kennel nearby them um, in case there's a, a situation that arises during a presentation, um, that kenneling is so strong that we can put the kennel in front of them and kennel them in, which kind of helps end the session quickly if we need to end the session. So that's the very first thing that we train them on. Um, we also harness and leash train them. Um, depending on the tamandoa, sometimes this goes really easy and sometimes um, we do have to um, provide a lot of positive reinforcement while we're putting the harness on them as well. Um, and then leash training, um, we actually um, don't always use a leash during our presentations depending on how strong the targeting and kennel behavior is. Um, so you can see we have one tamandoa on the bottom that doesn't have a leash and then the other ones um, do have a leash if they're just kind of learning new areas or um, learning um, to solidify their targeting behavior a little bit better. And that leads us to target training. So we um, do have kind of a special target stick that has a green ball at the end. They're all trained to target just their nose to the stick. Um, we do need to be very specific at targeting. Otherwise, some of our tamandoas will try to train the trainers and get a little bit lazy. So it is working really closely with everybody who is working to train tamandoa to make sure that we our critique for that behavior is really solid and precise. Um, so that the Tamandoa um, will be able to accomplish that task for everybody um, correctly. And then we do use a clicker. Sometimes, um, depending on the Tamandoa in the past, we've had some Tamandoa that when we use the clicker, it kind of startles them a little bit. So if that's the case, we will switch to using the word good instead of the clicker. So again, every Tamandoa seems to be a little bit different and it's just working with that Tamandoa and having a really good open communication with all of the Tamandua trainers of what works best for that specific individual. A new behavior that we are training all of our Tamanduas right now is the stationing. And that's the two pictures that have the red disc in them. And we started this behavior because as we go into the Tamandua habitats and specifically as our animal care staff went into service the habitat um, some tamandoas, like Zoshi here, is extremely food motivated, almost to the point that she gets a little bit too excited sometimes when you're coming into her habitat. So um, for safety, we um, have her station while we're outside of her kennel. So you can see the, um, the staff is outside her kennel, having her up on the stump to station her, and her station is putting her nose on this red disc. And then while she's up on that platform, the keeper then can then safely walk into her habitat and then work on harnessing her. And all of our tamandoas are, get harnessed from their station as well. And it just makes it a little bit more um, safe and easier to work with them. They're up off the ground. Again, we need to be really careful when we're working with them because they do have very powerful claws. We've been really fortunate here at the zoo not to have any major injuries, but that's not always the case. And um, it's just something that you need to be mindful and um, when you're working with tamandos, not be complacent that, you know, that, that the tamandoa will, will always kind of be um, really easy to work with, that things might startle them and they might um, use their claws as a way to protect themselves. Um, we do have set exploration places for our tamandoa, and I'll go into where our presentation spaces look in just a moment. And then um, they do always have the choice to participate or not. So we have four tamandoa and we've always had um, more than one tamandoa, which makes us fortunate because we, um, if one tamandoa chooses not to participate, more than likely the other tamandoas or at least one of the other tamandoas will. And they make it really obvious that they don't want to participate. We go in, um, they're normally in their nest box as tamandoa do sleep a lot. And um, we can offer them some food and try to target them. And sometimes they will come out and other times they will just literally curl their head back into their body and go back asleep. And so it's very obvious when a tamandoa chooses not to participate in training, 
Um, and then we just then move on to um, working with another Tamandua, or if none of them choose to participate, we just don't use Tamandua at that particular day. So our presentation areas, we've kind of evolved over the years. The um, rolling log, the log that's on the rolling cart was our very first Tamandua presentation area. And it's something that we still use because it is so versatile. So we have found that having a set spot where the Tamandua can climb up, be off of the ground, and then have a set area where they can go and explore works best for us rather than um, having a stage and kind of throwing things out there. So being able to get them to be up off the ground, climbing, and then getting them engaged by targeting um, works best for us. So we started with this um, rolling cart. We then migrated to the picture um, on the stage um, where you see the rolling cart and then a really, really long log. This was a really, really successful presentation area for us. We also have the opportunity that um, in the grassy circle around us, we can hold about 120 or so um, guests and we had a microphone system set up. So it was a really, really great um, presentation area. The only thing that we had to be very mindful about um, being in Tucson, Arizona, where temperatures can be 105 in the summer, is um, we needed to be careful about what temperatures we were bringing the Tamandua out. And even if it was an acceptable temperature for them to be out, we still had to be really mindful of the heat of the concrete. So we did have to hose it down um, before we did presentations kind of late spring. Um, um, currently, the two bottom pictures are what we're using for our presentation space. We just recently have um, built a pollinator garden, and then within our pollinator garden, we have this space um, for tamandoas. We also can use it for other animals, but we built it with tamandoa in mind. Um, we do have a log that they can climb up and kind of hang down off of, and then that mound with the stick coming out of it, that is actually... Um, a replica of a termite mound that we made out of concrete in-house. And then there's PVC pipes um, in it where we can put worms or honey or some avocado that they can investigate. And then they can climb all the way up to the top of the branches as well. So it's a neat way to showcase their adaptations. The second picture on the bottom is in our health center, in our classroom in the health center. Um, you can see we have views into the pharmacy and into the treatment room. And then on the ground, we have um, kind of a multi-purpose area where we use for different animals that come into the classroom and Tamandua are one of them. So being able to have them explore, we can hide different things on the ground for them and then target them back and forth up on the, um, the pedestal um, stand that you see there so that people in a smaller setting can get to see their adaptations as well. Um, some of the rewards that we use for our Tamandua is um, mango, mango baby food, which is an enormous hit with all of our Tamandoas at the moment. Um, wax worms. Um, so it depends on, again, working really closely with the vet team to see if there's a limit on wax worms or not. Um, at times we have limits and at other times, like right now, we don't have limits. So again, um, having that really open communication um, so that we as educators, when we train, are making sure that we're um, not negatively affecting the animal's diet or weight. We also use avocado. Avocado is something really great. If you want to do a little bit longer of a presentation or give guests an opportunity to take pictures at a distance, giving half a avocado to an anteater is a great way to keep them occupied for a long time while you talk about all their different adaptations and have kind of a photo op moment. And then we do use honey, although we do use honey in a limited amount um, just because it does have lots of sugar in it. And it, it does go a long way, so um, we don't really need that much. Um, we also present a lot of our um, rewards in kind of this clear plastic like test tube and we cut a circular hole at the top of it so they can stick their tongue through. So it's a way to make, you know, giving the animal, giving the tomatoes these, these treats makes it a little bit less messy for staff, a little bit safer since it's plastic and not the glass jars that the baby food comes in. And also um, guests will be able to see their tongue going in and out. So it's a, um, a cool way to, again, showcase that adaptation. So um, all of this training definitely helps us with programs, but it also helps our um, animal care team as well. So there's lots of um, husbandry benefits, having, anim um, to having animals that are so used to 
um, being near other staff and working with them. So you can see that we can have them kind of stay on their own voluntarily um, if we need to do x-rays. We could do the same thing with ultrasound or we can put them on our lap for ultrasound and again, give them um, some baby food or some wax worms to enjoy while we're doing an ultrasound. Um, we can also do blood draws. We normally do that through their tail as well as vaccinations. And then um, with neonatal care, with caring for the youngsters, because um, the dames are so used to us being in their space and working with them, um, we have really not had any negative reactions from the dames when we're taking their pup um, to be weighed or anything. So having that relationship um, with the Tamandawas where they're used to us being in their space has been really beneficial um, for everybody on, at the zoo. So who, who am I talking about when I say, when we train and when we work with the Tamandoas? Um, I kind of alluded a little bit to collaborating and having really good communication. So the team that trains the Tamandoas is um, right now education staff. We've had a couple of um, staffing turnovers in our animal ambassador area. Um, but their education staff has kind of remained consistent. So during those transitions, we've kind of stepped up a little bit to um, continue with the Tamandua training. Um, and then also the animal care staff is also training them as well as providing them with all of the husbandry that they need. And when staff is trained for working with Tamandoas, whether they are the animal care team or the education staff, they have this official checkout log that I've copied here. And you can see that there are um, different times where you have to practice with the keeper or with trained staff um, going over kind of the different behavior and husbandry. Um, that takes a little bit longer than you might think. We have four tamandoas. And as I mentioned, they're all very, very different of what they will eat and what their behaviors are. And so going through that with um, all the different staff that works with them is really important. Um, handling emergencies, how do you pick up a tamandua if there's an emergency situation or if they happen to get out of their harness, um, how do you do that safely without harming yourself? Um, and then having them then go through all of the different steps um, of how you target them, panel them, get them into a, a harness, and then um, doing our, the different presentations. So you have to be checked out on not only the training of the tamandua, but also what you're actually saying during a presentation as well, because your conservation messaging is just as important as um, your training. So some challenges of working with tamandoas. Um, I um, have been working with them a long time and I love working with them but um, there, there are some challenges. And um, certainly if you're thinking of a tamandua for your um, facility, there are different things that you have to think about. They are very um, time consuming animals, particularly if you have four of them. Um, so um, no two tamandua are the same. So here are um, just a few of the challenges that I thought of as I was preparing um, for this talk. Um, the first one is food motivation. Um, normally in the past, we have been able to use honey and um, fruit, uh, fruit based baby food and wax worms. Um, now our tamandoas are very picky. They prefer mango baby food, not mango apple, because we tried that and none of them would eat that. So it needs to be mango. And now we're finding out it needs to be a certain brand of mango baby food. And then also we have a tamandua that, um, will only eat wax worms if it's delivered to her one by one by hand. And when you're training a tamandua, having that slow of a reward delivery doesn't really work. So right now for her, it is just mango baby food. So figuring that out could be a challenge. Um, also, they have different personalities and sometimes different things will make them react in a defensive way. Um, it gets very windy here sometime in Tucson. And so we've had Tamandoa that they've been perfectly fine and all of a sudden a gust of wind comes and they turn on their back and you know appear that they're ready to like be, be attacked. And so um, kind of understanding what may make each individual um, kind of be stressed or have a defensive posturing is really important. I was on an outreach once and I had a tamandua off grounds and it was in a harness on a leash. And I was looking for different things to provide him with some enrichment during the program. And I picked up a handful of pine needles and all of a sudden noticed that the behavior of the tamandua was completely different. And he started to like turn and walk towards me in an aggressive manner. 
And I didn't know why, because nothing had changed and we had worked together for years. And all of a sudden I dropped the pine needles because I realized that was the only thing that changed. And then his demeanor, he totally calmed down and was back to normal. So being super aware of, of different things that might happen, um, different things outside of your environment, noises um, is, is really important. Because again, yes, there are a small anteater, but they still have very, very powerful claws um, and you need to be aware of that at all times. We also have had um, tamandoas that have been um, sensitive to walking on different substrate. So um, just being aware of that and trying to troubleshoot of why they might be doing that. Um, one female in particular, many years ago, she wouldn't walk on dirt. I'm not sure why she would walk into her um, habitat and that had hay in it, um, but she would not walk on dirt. And so the solution was just as simple as putting a log on the dirt and she would walk on the log. And then eventually through targeting, you can target her off the log. And maybe she didn't realize she was walking on the sand, but then after that, she was fine walking on the sand. So just being kind of extra aware of, of different things and being having the ability to troubleshoot and kind of think like a tamandoa to solve the problems. Um, the other challenge is that, um, off-ground outreaches could be kind of a challenge. And I um, am sure there are many facilities that are using them off-ground that have great success. Um, we haven't. Um, we've had some that, um, due to the long transportation, they were getting kind of down the line here, the white ocular discharge, which is a sign of stress. And so we didn't want to do that. Um, and then also, we can't just bring them into any classroom as we prefer to have lots of space for them to be able to move um, and still be in a safe environment. And when you're going on an outreach, you never quite know, particularly if it's an indoors outreach, you never quite know how the room will be set up or how close participants will be to you. So um, that's one um, kind of challenge. So right now um, we do not have any of our tomandoas going off ground. So everything we do with them is on ground. Um, sometimes Tamando will have a one-track mind. So even though you would like to target them and you would like them to go up onto their climbing structure and continue to target with you, sometimes there's something that smells really good in that room that they just can't stop thinking about. And so um, kind of understanding that that might happen. And again, having the kennel nearby is a good way to avoid any potential um, issues that might happen, particularly if you're in a presentation situation. Um, we have had tamandoa that have had allergies, allergies to the substrate that they were in and also allergies to certain food proteins. Um, so that's something um, to be aware of as well. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, Dr. Walk Colburn did a really um, excellent presentation on some of the health concerns of tamandoa as well. And so you can find that um, recording. Um, I mentioned the white ocular discharge that they sometimes get, which is a stress um, reaction. And um, just being able to understand that that happens and work slowly with tamandoas that it happens with. We've had tamandoas that never have it. And we have tamandoas that when we kennel them and bring them into, um, drive them on a cart to a presentation area, they might get that white discharge as we're bringing them to the presentation area. So coming up with ways to um, make them more calm, like continually feeding them or giving them positive reinforcement or rewards while they're traveling has been successful for us um, to, to um, not have that happen very often. And then um, temperature guidelines, as I mentioned, we're in Tucson, Arizona. So in the summer, we pretty much cannot do outside tomato presentations because it's too hot for them. So 60 to 80 degrees is kind of our ideal temperature where we're um, bringing our tamandua outside. We do have two classrooms, so we can do indoor programs. So they do come to our summer camp programs when they're outside only for a short amount of time when they're traveling to the classroom. And then um, keep in mind that cold mornings, they're going to be sleeping in because they have kind of a low body temperature. And just like anteaters, they're going to sleep in if it's really cold out. Um, more challenges, but not necessarily to Mandoa related, is um, just keeping in mind when you're doing a presentation for with Tamandoa or with any animal, um, no two presentations are going to be the same. So there might be one presentation where the Tamandoa is spot on and they're hitting every target and they're kenneling great, but maybe that presentation you're preoccupied with the targeting and your presentation and what you're actually saying um, is not great or um, your targeting um, may be off or how you're presenting the 
food reward may be a little bit slow too. So when you have a great presentation where everything clicks, it's awesome, but um, it doesn't always happen. And then um, similarly, no two trainers are the same. As you can see the picture here um, of Brittany, um, one of our education specialists here at the zoo, there's a lot that we have to manage when you're training in Tandua. You have a target stick, you have a leash, you have um, the, uh, the reward, the food, and then also probably she has um, wax worms in one of her pouches. And so figuring out how to manage all of that in your hands while you're also making sure that the tamandua is, um, is targeting successfully and that you're clicking at the right time and then giving the reward, um, it could be a lot to manage. And so we frequently videotape our training sessions so that we can kind of critique each other. And it's very helpful to watch yourself train. Um, people can give you advice all they want, but until you actually hear their advice and then see why they're giving you that advice, um, sometimes that it takes both of that in order to make it click. Um, also, um, no two presentations are the same. You can see our Tamandoa Leti here. Um, this has happened to us with multiple Tamandoas is it's sunny out and it's a great spring day and they just decide to fall asleep in the middle of your presentation. So that's when your, you know, 10 minute presentation becomes a lot longer as you're waiting for a tomato to wake up from their little sun nap. And then the last thing is just reminding staff of safety um, and having them not get complacent that this tomando that you work with all the time is going to be awesome all the time. Um, we have had tomando um, kind of grab shoes, right? Because shoes smell really great sometimes. And so you need to make sure that you're keeping tomando away from your shoes, away from guest shoes. Um, and just being mindful again that you have an animal that um, could potentially be dangerous. Um, and so um, being always mindful of that. Um, so here in, I know um, we have people from all over the world joining, but here within the Association of Zoos and Aquariums in North America, we primarily have Southern Tamandua and um, Harrison Adele, who um, is from the Dallas Sioux. And I know we have some people from the Dallas Sioux joining us today. Um, so he is the SSP coordinator for Tamandua. So um, if you're within AZA and you are wanting a Tamandua um, for your animal ambassador program or for uh, a habitat, um, please um, reach out to Harrison um, and he can assist you and offer guidance as well. Um, I am sure if you are from a non-AZA zoo and you need um, information or questions, I'm not sure if I can speak for him, but I will, um, you can reach out to him as well um, and he can um, assist you um, in that. If you want more information or if you're a zoo that's joining us and you have a tomando at your institution, we have um, the um, Animal Ambassador Resource and Information Center called ERIC. Um, this is through the Animal Ambassadors Scientific Advisory Group. There is a page on Southern Tamandoa. I put the website down here um, so that you can look at it through the recording. But um, we have a bunch of information on Tamandoa, but there's also ways that if you are looking at this information and you have Tamandoa that you use as Animal Ambassadors and you would like to contribute, um, please do. I think the more information that we have on them, um, the better, particularly when we're talking about diets and different ways that we're training them, different rewards that we're doing, um, and different health issues. So some of that um, is all already on this page, and we'd love for more people to contribute as well. So opportunities for messaging. Um, so there are um, kind of three main messages. Um, adaptations, um, obviously that's an easy one. Um, habitat loss and the pet trade. So um, adaptations, we're always looking for ways when we do presentations to make sure that we're showcasing their adaptations. So either having them stand at the edge of a log so that guests are gonna be able to see their claws feeding them um, their reward out of a large tube or a clear tube where guests can see um, their tongue. So you can see a couple of pictures of that. Also, um, anything that we could do to get them to stretch out their body or hang from their tail um, so that guests can see their, um, their prehensile tail. Um, giving them enrichment, I mentioned avocado, but pumpkin's always a good one too to watch them kind of tear it up. And then this um, last one on the left-hand side is a close-up picture of those PVC pipes that I said that we had in our anteater mound as well. And so they're just stuck right in, uh, stuck in, and then the concrete was um, poured around them. And those are just great for having them kind of explore around the termite mound. 
Um, another opportunity for messaging is habitat loss. This is an issue that is um, more so, I believe, with the northern Tamandua populations, but um, encouraging guests to um, purchase shade, shade grown coffee um, or eating less meat, since those are two issues where the um, habitat degradation and um, land use changes are happening that's negatively affecting um, Tamandua habitat. And then the last one is the big one is the um, pet trade. So here in the United States, back in like 2015, um, the scientific advisory group did a study um, on all of the imports of Tamando that came into the United States. And um, zoos were part of that number, but there were only like 40 or so Tamando that we knew were brought into the US um, that were in our facilities. And there were a couple of hundred more that were not part of um, our, our acquisitions. And so um, it was kind of put to wonder where those Tamandua were. Um, are, are they in private facilities? And if so, it was odd because no zoos were um, being called about how we care for them and what diet or none of them were being surrendered as you know a pet that nobody ever that somebody didn't want anymore and so there was concern that even though you know there was a bunch being imported there was concern about the fate of those animals and so um we um did a um i, I this was right when i became the ssp education advisor and so i reached out to a lot of zoos that had um Tamandua already, and um, luckily all of them were already doing pet trade messaging, and so we didn't really have to do that much um, in um, for our own messaging. And then it was at the same time that they were starting to prepare for um, the Latin American um, Association of Zookeepers conference, and I believe this was back in 2016, and they were kicking off a campaign, um, Save a Life, Leave Tamanduas in the Wild. And so um, one of my very first things as a Tamandua SSP education advisor was creating this poster um, that um, I created and then Reed Park Sue um, was able to pay for the printing and then they were able to distribute this to participating zoos um, within that conference. And um, the idea was is to discourage people from um, having Tamandua as a pet by kind of bringing up all of the different things, um, the hardships, the challenges of having them as a pet. Um, and then specifically, saying that most taken from the wild do not survive. Um, and so hopefully um, that's where the Save a Life campaign came from. I, you'll hear about this later from Kenny, but um, zenarthurns.org has a bunch of educational materials and new videos. And there is one about anteaters um, talking about the pet trade. And this was just a, a great quote um, from that video, keep them in your heart, but leave them in the wild. Additionally, AZA, the Wildlife Trafficking, Trafficking Alliance, has a new campaign called notapet.net. And the message there is if you love them, leave them be. And um, kind of the, the summary of both of them is that the pet trade, we're not dealing with people who don't like animals. We're dealing with people who love animals, um, almost love them too much that they want to own them. And so encouraging them and telling them the correct way to love animals is to leave them in the wild. And so that's kind of the, the um, messaging that we're trying to do um, with both. And um, so this is um, messaging with the, the AZA, the Wildlife Trafficking Alliance, the Not a Pet campaign. There are multiple, multiple messaging um, in, in, in this, and you can. Um, go to their website, notapet.net, um, to learn more about all of their different messaging. These are the two that I think specifically kind of resonate with Tamandua the most in that um, they, they need a lot of space, the cost of their care, um, and that they have other financial obligations. And then of course their specialized diet, um, which could be very, very time consuming to create and is very specialized, making sure they get all the protein and nutrients um, and supplements um, that they need in order to remain healthy. Um, this right now is being piloted in three different zoos. And I'm assuming after that, then it will be kind of maybe tweaked, however it needs to be tweaked, and then um, disseminated out to the rest of the zoos as well. Um, 
They also are, um, not only is it important to um, talk about having a tamando as a pet, but it's also important to talk to guests about the power of social media and the power of what they're posting, what they're liking, what they're sharing. Um, this is one, you know, that I just randomly grabbed from the internet, which this is a tamandoa, obviously not a very happy tamandoa, but a, a tamandoa that feels like it needs to be on the defense. Um, and that, so that those are not images that we want to keep portraying or animals that are in distress. And so um, again, the notapet.net campaign um, has also social media packages related to social media posts. So limiting what you like, um, think before you're clicking. Um, so those are important things that for a lot of species that we have at our zoo, when we're talking, when we're doing um, keeper chats or education programs, reminding people that um, the power that they have in social media and not to kind of make having these pets be a norm um, because that is that is what we're concerned is going to happen is that if people keep seeing it on social media and seeing their friends liking it, um, it will become the norm. And then, you know, having a tomato as a pet, well, what's the big deal? I've seen like 10 different people on the internet have it. And so we want to make sure that we stop doing that. Additionally, um, in Costa Rica, they have the Stop Animal Selfies campaign that they're doing. I don't know if anybody from that campaign is joining us, but at the end, we'll get a chance to chat. And so if you want to jump in and um, talk more about that, that would be great. But um, from kind of a zoo standpoint, um, it's a kind of our responsibility to be mindful of what opportunities we're providing to our guests and what when they post their experience here at the zoo what is that post looking like and what are we are we showing an animal that we're kind of forcing into a situation or for or, or are we um showing an animal that might be away from the guest and the animal has kind of the choice to participate and not be near a guest or maybe not be touched um so just being mindful of opportunities that we're providing to our guests um and and making sure that we're not contributing to um having people in close contact with any wild animal, in addition, um, proliferating the pet trade by um, what we're providing for our guests. Um, so that is my last official um, slide. So I want to thank you for joining us. I would like um, to hear from you guys. I'd like to hear about like thoughts and what you do at your zoo. Um, certainly thoughts about pet message training because um, it, it can be kind of a, a, an interesting subject to talk about. And if there are specific messages that work best with your zoo, um, it would be great to share. Kenny is jump, gonna jump in for just a few minutes to talk about the specialist group. But um, if you are interested in sticking around for a conversation, um, that would be great. And I will turn it over to Kenny. Thank you, Jennifer. That was wonderful. And uh, yeah, I'm excited for the discussion. I just want to talk about the specialist group just for maybe two or three minutes. For those of you who do not know, our website is anarthrans.org. We have a Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube page. The YouTube page has our archived monthly webinars. And uh, the Instagram and the Facebook are the photos and the videos are provided by specialist group members. So if you are a member and you have photos, please feel free to share them. If you go to zanarthrans.org, you will see that we have um, the zanarthrans, the armadillos, sloths, and anteaters. We have profiles on pretty much all of the up-to-date species. We're gonna be changing a few of those things in the next six months but it's quite up to date. And like Jennifer was mentioning, this past year we published four animated videos. And what's special about them is that each of the videos is available in English, Spanish, and Brazilian Portuguese. So if you are in any of those Central or South American countries or North America, feel free to use our videos. We have one on sauce, one on anteaters, one on armadillos, and then one on kind of the evolution and uh, overall welfare of Xenarthrans. All right, so we also have to accompany all of those videos, we have worksheets and puzzles and coloring sheets and spot the difference that we 
would love for you to utilize in your educational programming. These resources are also available in the free languages. Our next webinar is going to be on June 14th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And it's going to be with Lindsay Sears. And she's going to be talking about um, the taxonomic advisory group and the species survival plan for xenarthrins in AZA facilities. So we're very excited to be talking about that. And like I mentioned earlier, even if you're at a zoological facility, and like Jennifer was mentioning, if you have a photo of them in kind of a natural setting, we would love to promote that on our social media pages. If you feel inspired, uh, you can go to our website, zenarthrins.org, and click that donate button so we can fund researchers who are on the ground in Central and South America studying the cryptic Xenarthrin group because they're quite difficult to uh, study. Or if you don't want to just give us money, we have a store now. We have a little clothing store. And you can see I'm wearing my Glyptodon shirt today. You can get anteaters. You can get a tamandua. You can get the whole anteater family, sloths, tote bags. Um, you can get a Glyptodon shower curtain. You would be the talk of the town. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because when you buy these things, all the proceeds go to the Xenarthrin group so we can do more education and conservation initiatives. The webinar and our education initiatives are also sponsored by our two partner institutions, FIA, the Foundation for International Aid to Animals and Nurtured by Nature. All right, and with that, we're going to ask Jennifer some questions. Obviously, you're gonna to need to talk to the, your zoological institute about how they're maintaining the grounds but have you given your tamandua's logs that have ants that, that have little microorganisms kind of beaming out of them? Um, we do. We don't necessarily intentionally do it all the time, um, but it does happen. And um, frequently as we're kind of working on training, we're walking them behind the scenes in an area and they um, happen to find their own ants. So it's, they come up with their own enrichment. So they, they, it is, but not intentional. And have you ever used the insectivore diet as the reinforcer? Or they're kind we of haven't. Being... Yeah, we haven't. We um, soak it. So I think it might be a little bit challenging and other zoos, please jump in if you have success doing it. Um, but we haven't here. So we've basically stuck with just baby food, um, avocado, honey. We used to use yogurt, but we don't use yogurt anymore for training due to the high calcium contra, contra, concentrate. All right, Sarah from Dallas Zoo says, does your team mask around Tamandua still? Um, we don't right now. We All of our um, staff that works with Tamandoas has been fully vaccinated. Um, we were doing N95 for a very long time, but we're not currently masking right now. Um, we are still maintaining a six foot distance from all guests um, though. We used to do Tamandoa walks in the zoo and those have been on hold since COVID and we have not had those return yet. And then uh, Sarah said that in the past they've combined slightly moistened insectivore gently mixed with finely chopped crickets. Sounds delicious. <laughs> All right, do we have any other questions? All right, Lauren says, do you train your tamandos for voluntary nail trims? We do not. Um, we, have, we have never done that here. I'm saying, are there any questions? And there's like a whole list of questions that I skipped over. Mariella says, what are the signs you use to determine that a tamandua is stressed and you should stop the interaction with visitors? So having the milky eyes, the white ocular discharge is kind of, is the first one that happens. So sometimes they will get it if we're transporting them for a presentation and we will wait to make sure that clears um, before we begin the presentation. And if it doesn't, then the presentation's over. Um, it, we have never happened, had that happen during a presentation, but that certainly would be a sign. Um, what we have happened is that the tamandoas kind of get over, overly stimulated. Um, and so that's a sign, um, particularly if they're a little bit 
too food motivated. And that's a sign that we have a very, very short ses session and then kennel them right away. So it's kind of beyond the ocular discharge. It is kind of up to that personality of the tomandoa that we decide. Now, in another webinar, we talked about tomandoa health and veterinarian care but somebody is asking what dietary supplements are crucial in the zoo setting? So I uh, came prepared for this one. Um, so yeah, vitamin, they need vitamin K. And again, I would, whoever, whoever asked that question, I would definitely um, ask that you watch Dr. Walk Colburn's talk because she goes into that with detail. I, again, am not on the animal care sign, but I can tell you what they are, but she tells you the amounts and the reasons. So vitamin K for sure, um, taurine, um, vitamin C is what we give. Um, we also give a probiotic. And then there's also, um, as they get older, we've had some tomato that are very old, like right now we have one that's 17. So we do have different um, geriatric supplementations um, for joints and kidney and liver support that we give too. Um, but again, I'm going to refer you to Dr. Walt Coburn's site, or talk, please. Very good. Um, somebody else asks, do you ever find the clicker training overstimulating for tomatoes? And I know you did mention that sometimes they get a little nervous with the noise in the beginning. Yep. And sometimes, sometimes you'll see that it's just, um, they, they kind of just have a little like um, small reaction to it. They kind of just jump a little bit. And that's when we just don't use the clicker anymore and we just use the word good. It works just as well. Becca would like to know if you use any non-food rewards for training. We do not. It is all food motivated. They don't seem to really care about any tactile rewards or anything like that. So it is all food related. All right, you have several people, Lauren, Lewis, Mariella saying you did a wonderful talk. Thank you, awesome Thank talk. You. Um, great talk. I unmuted Mariella. Um, yeah, we definitely support the Stop the Selfie campaign. So as zoo educators, like you were mentioning, having that photo opportunity of maybe like a natural setting um, is something that we probably want to be promoting rather than hugging mm -hmm. them, touching them, because that's going to lead to more pets. Absolutely. And I don't know if Mariella, you wanted to add more about the Stop the Selfie campaign or anybody who wanted to add about campaigns that they're, they're doing at their own zoo about the pet trade. Uh, no, our member from Costa Rica reported that um, post pandemia, um, she got more requests for selfies with sloths because people want to you know, experience something different and something exciting and then share it on social media. So it is really <laughs> necessary to uh, to spread the word about the Stop Animal Selfies campaign. Um, and I also, I, I just looked at the Not A Pet uh, website and there is actually one of uh, the PDFs or of the things you can share on social media that has a slough. So maybe our specialist group could join that uh, campaign and also share that on our social media. Maybe we could make one with a tamandua and add it to that not a pet, uh, not .net campaign. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of following kind of where the not a pet net campaign goes um that right now they're focusing on three species i think it's an african gray a spider monkey and i think a leopard tortoise or another species of tortoise um so I, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves and if we can maybe put tomato in there too well call us if <laughs> we can convince them to, <laughs> to use tomato that would be really great i mean um we had these posters about uh, tomandos not being pets in English, Spanish, and Portuguese, which was very useful uh, because we wanted to reach both zoos and, and zoo visitors in South America and in the US. And yeah, we should actually repeat that because um, people forget <laughs> quite quickly about, about that. Uh, Jennifer, you have at least one more question. Sarah would like to know, are there any 
other behaviors that you have trained, like a tail hang or a rope climb? Um, we have trained a tail hang. So it was when we were doing the presentation on the stage and we had that long, long log. Um, so we would just target them down. And again, it's based on the Tamandua kind of behavior, if they're willing to do that behavior for us or not. Um, we have not trained a rope climb. That would be a fun one to try. I put my email in the chat box um, and also wanted to thank everybody for joining today. But if you wanted to reach out um, with any further questions or as the education advisor for the Tamando SSP, if you're like, we should do this um, for animal ambassadors, um, let me know. Um, we are, I think, going to start working on um, an animal ambassador protocol for Tamandoa since there isn't one currently. Um, so I know um, the animal ambassador SAG that's on their list. And so I reached out to them to see if we can start that. So if anyone else on the call is interested, um, please send me an email and we can get a whole group working on it. I'll spread the word among our members. So maybe somebody uh, who is not on the webinar uh, would be interested also in, in participating and, and providing some, some feedback. All right, we should well, do the same for sloths. <laughs> yes. That would be the next step. <laughs> I know. I'm, I was thinking that more people want a pet sloth than a tamandua. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, there are quite a few people who want tamanduas and, yeah, take them for a walk. Because, I mean, with sloth, you know, you cannot show them <laughs> as much <Yeah. laughs> as you can show and exhibit your tamandua. So, yeah, I mean, there is sloth uh, wine tasting and sloth yoga and stuff like that. But still, I think tamanduas are quite attractive as exotic pets, unfortunately. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. We hope you attend all of our other webinars. And if you missed the first half dozen, you can go to our YouTube page, website, Facebook, and watch the past recordings. And thank you, Jennifer, for joining us. And everyone else, have a great night. Thank you, everybody, thank you for so joining. Fun. Thank you.